Welcome to another episode of the SCM Podcast. Jack Bryce and Zach Hewlett are back here again. And today we're joined by Kent Karish. How are you, Kent? I'm doing good. How are you doing? Doing very well, thank you. Man, I'm glad to have you on the podcast. <laughs> it's, it's taken me like two years of begging. You were like contact zero. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I never said no. So, you know, eventually I was going to say yes. Yeah, you said you said eventually, and here we are. So I really appreciate it. All right. Well, start us off with how you ended up in Scotland, you know, leading up to the mission, pre-mission story, whatever you want to share in that regard. Yeah, I think I try to take the philosophy in life, or at least I believe that most things do not happen for a reason, but there are things that happen for a reason. And my mission call maybe plays kind of both parts of the coin in that regard. I, my mission call, I'm trying to think of the best way to describe it. I had a bishop who was real instrumental in getting me be more active in the church. Um, I also had a best friend, and I talked about this in my farewell, who had passed away from uh, bone cancer. And as he was going through chemo uh, and a variety of different type of treatments he had, he eventually had about 75% of his lungs cut out because the cancer had spread to his lungs. But at the same time, as my life wasn't as happy as it could be, my friend's life was seemed to be more peaceful. And at the same time, I had a bishop who kind of, uh, maybe it was perfect timing, but uh, he invited me to go shotgun shooting uh, from time to time. And I was receptive, probably about as receptive as I had been on the podcast uh, to come on the podcast. But he kept asking and uh, I agreed to go shotgun shooting. And then when we were out shooting one time, he said, uh, you know, how about you meet me this Wednesday uh, so we can talk about the church or something like that? And so I, I met him and we went and that kind of set me on a path to uh, go on a mission. Well, my bishop uh, was Bob Monson. It was President Monson's brother. And it was and Bob. He had also gone on a couple's mission. I don't know how many years earlier uh decades earlier him and his wife laura went on a mission there and i know in my mission papers i had said i don't do well in hot climates and i didn't want to learn like a new la new language and my bishop said he wanted me to either go to scotland or maybe he thought i would go to mongolia i mean that would have been pretty cool i don't think i would have i don't think i would have I think the learning a language would have been too hard for me. Uh, nonetheless, uh, I, I opened my call and I, I had a call to Scotland. And there's also another gentleman in my ward at the time who is kind of a legend where he still calls all the young men on their birthdays uh, to wish him a happy birthday. But his name is Jim Pingree or James Pingree. And he was... He was actually the one that did all the the you know the Scotland Edinburgh mission reunions uh, for many years. Uh, he was an assistant to Elder Haight at the. Uh, oh wow! Let's let's uh, stop here for a moment for Mr. Gilmore. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! The freaking professional is in the building. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> a surprise guest host what's up boys <laughs> alex good to see you brother you too my man you too oh my gosh this is awesome this is so cool yeah how you how you doing gil brother i'm i'm i am through the roof right now now that i see you and uh some of the people i love the most man this is cool how about yourself i'm doing good uh William and Layla, I got twins that are four and a half years old, a boy and a girl, and they're upstairs fighting to go to bed, but Kristen's <laughs> doing the, the good fight up there with them. Nice. So nice. doing good. I, I hope I look a little, like I have some energy, but I'm pretty worn out because they just graduated from the napping phase, and so that's kind of rough. 
they get really grumpy. Yeah, dude, that's a, it's a tough time, man, but it's also, uh, it's, it's very cool to see them like go through different phases and man, it's, uh, yeah, that's crazy. I'm, I'm a bit worn out too. I've been working all day. I'm in California, um, on a business trip and, um, so I'm in my hotel room right now. And, um, so if I look a little beat up, it's because I've been working all day. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to take over the podcast here. I was about to tell a little bit about my mission call, but we also don't want to keep you from your doing your uh, good business tomorrow. You're probably, probably tired. <laughs> it's all good, man. I'm just, I was happy to be, be a part of the, uh, of, of the, of the crew here, man. So, um, yeah, it's, this is awesome. This is really cool. I love yeah. it. I love it. What do you want to do? Just listen and get bored? Or do you just want to talk about uh, running the streets in Pollock or wherever we were? Yeah, man, let's, let's talk about some good stories. Then I'll, I'll, I'll jump off and let you guys kind of conclude it. Um, but uh, yeah, sorry. I, I probably, I probably crashed the party for jumping in so late. So I, I apologize, man. You're right. Uh, perfect. Yeah. And finish finish your story of getting your call and then we'll jump into All right. so you and Alex. Uh, I also so we were talking about how my bishop uh was President Monson's brother and he went on a mission there. And uh I don't think uh Elder Clark Davis has been on the podcast, but Clark Davis uh, was the grandson of Robert Monson, the bishop. And uh, Elder Davis and I also have birthdays. Uh, mine's April 30th. His is April 27th. Uh, we grew up go doing scouts and things like that together. Uh, weren't necessarily too close in junior high or high school, but after high school and preparing for mission, we, we became closer. But we both got our calls to Scotland on the same day. Uh, and, oh, cool. you know, I don't know if the special good word was put in or not, <laughs> but it, you know, there's lots of things that I would say, at least for the mission call, the things I experienced in, in life happened for a reason, even though I, I stated, I think most things don't happen for a reason, but definitely the call to Scotland uh, happened for a reason. And I was, I was super excited about that. And uh, so that's, that's the intro in the call. Uh, so cool yeah perfect all right and the timing of that was was when uh i would have i don't know when i got the call would have been literally maybe about 22 years ago so probably february 20 2002 i think i reported to mtc either may or june of 2002 in preston all right awesome. great Okay, yeah, we can we can skip now. We can jump right into you and Gilmore wherever you want to hit things off. And <laughs> well, we are live. I mean, I'll keep it as appropriate as we can. But Gilmore and I, <laughs> but we had four and a half months together. I had two companions for four and a half months, and Alec was by far the most pleasant. Um, I think maybe after month four, maybe we got a little sick of each other. I don't know. <laughs> yeah we good yeah it, it it was it was it was awesome man i, I remember uh dude like because you know because karish and i would kind of pat cross paths all throughout the mesh uh every time we saw each other like at that conference we'd always just like like you know hook uh, like just it was, it was awesome seeing him i was like man i hope i serve with that dude one day and then uh i remember when when uh when del about was leaving i think he actually went to was he ap the delbot go to ap i can't remember i think so i mean i don't know i don't know who else on the podcast has been uh like me but i do have every harvester there ever was yeah oh my gosh oh, look at that See? I can pull up the he, he's the professional <laughs> bro he's the professional for a reason man like come on but uh I, I remember uh when I was in uh when in, in Pollock getting the call and President Brains was like, Elder Gilmore, are you sitting down? I was like, Yeah, of course, President. And he's like, wanted to introduce you to your new companion. And then uh old Karis jump on. I freaking started screaming. It was it was like it was like Christmas morning, man. So <laughs> it was awesome. I you came I from the mission that. home? 
Karish? Yeah, I was I was in the mission home at that time, and I was with uh, I was with our good friend Elder Thomas from South Africa, who you had on. That's yeah. Right. So yeah, I came from the mission home. I probably maybe I learned before Alec did who my companion is. I'm pretty pretty sure I did, but I was super excited as well. Yeah. But it was also a little nerve wracking because I mean I was a uh, an office elder for six months, you know, and so. To, to have to go back and hit the streets really hard, uh, you know, maybe caused a little bit of anxiety. I don't know. Uh, Alec probably had to freshen up a bunch of my skills. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, I knew that, uh, you know, being in the office, it's, it's a different, it's a different breed altogether, but no, nah, man, he, you know, I mean, he got, he got to a uh, Pollock and he got right to work. I mean, you know, he was a uh, Karish was a uh, obviously hard, hardworking missionary. Loved the people, um, and uh, now there's there's no there's no, bro- no problems at all. He he loved the work. I, I think he was because he was in the office for so long. Like he was he was ready to just like, you know, hit the pavement pretty hard. And so, um, <laughs> yeah, it was awesome man. From day one, yeah, from day one, yeah. it was great. Cool. For the record, the January to February harvester of 2004 states so uh, awesome. Dale about <laughs> is an assistant with your good friend Hal. <laughs> Look at this. Look at this, man. I mean, come yeah, on. So. Come on. You're the professional, like, in his element right now. I think, though, like, I didn't know uh, Dale about too much. I think he was a bit more, I think he was quieter. I don't know. But. Yeah. You know, I think uh, Alec and I also both had potential trouble-causing uh, characteristics from our childhood, so maybe it was scary <laughs> to put both of us together. Well, I tell you what, man, we had some we had some awesome times, and we had, I mean, what, what, which which story which story you want to tell first? Actually, let's confirm. Uh, I can't recall if this was you and I, but I I do have a couple of things that should. Uh, get a laugh out of people um, <laughs> yes and also should be really sad uh <laughs> but i think i think this was with you right did we have to go pick up yeah. our, uh summer yeah we sure did yeah we sure so, did man uh wow. elder Wright, you guys may recall he was the one that had to have the facial reconstruction yeah yep. and elder summer here has has anyone talked to Mr. Summer at all? He was from England. He was from England. I don't yeah. think I've been in touch with him, no. Not yet. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, zone leaders, just, you know, young 20-year-olds, you know, maybe Alec and I had been in some street fights in our life. I don't know. I Maybe <laughs> I had. But the news sure article have. says, yep. thieves beat me senseless, victim kicked unconscious in street attack. As a terrified 21-year-old, Michael Summer lay dazed and helpless on a Paisley West End street. His head was repeatedly stamped on by four mindless yobs. During his nightmare ordeal, up to 50 blows rained down on him. His injuries include a suspected jaw fracture, a badly bruised left eye, cut and swollen lips, and a mass of bruises on his face, neck, and body. I think we literally picked him up and like got him we did. in the hospital. Yep. Yeah, we sure did. I- I, I I remember uh, going to the. I mean, it was late at night too, man. So we, you know, it was it was pretty late. We got there, and his shirt was just like just stained with blood. It was the it was crazy to see him that way. Yeah, and just kind of kind of shaken up and everything. And you know, we took him to his flat. Um, I, I believe we gave him a blessing. It was a pretty pretty powerful blessing, if I remember remember correctly. But yeah, because I mean, I I was with Elder Wright, um, not not too long after he got he got jumped he got beat up pretty good and then uh the another summer got beat up pretty good as well so it was yeah it was it was tough wow. and you guys were the the ambulance or you picked him up from the I hospital think, from I, the think what ha- I think what happened um i mean he went to like the equivalent of an instant care instant care and i don't know if his companion i can't recall i know we picked him up and yeah. it might have been where if anyone went, Alec went with him to to go to the doctor's office. Do you remember? Maybe it was his companion. Yep. Yeah. His his companion gave us a call, um, and he said that you know they're at the 
it was equivalent to an insta care and then we we humped we hopped in the car picked them up and then took them to the flat like we drove them to a flat and yeah. But this was so. This was when uh, missionaries or the mission got cell phones for the first time, and they went to yeah. take a cell phone. That's what it was about. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 right. Yeah, it was. I mean, that was a brand new thing, you know, back then. And uh, he he had just gotten that cell phone. You're right, man. Like I remember that. And uh, those those Neds tried to take his cell phone, and he wouldn't give it up. And he got he got battered, as they say. You know, pretty pretty good. So. Oh. <laughs> That's a, that's, tough, a tough that's a one. tough lesson to learn as a missionary. You know, you could hand that that over because it's a church's church issued thing and you get a new one, but you don't yeah. think about that in the moment. That had to have been tough. Yeah, it was it was it was tough to see him that way. I mean, you know, he, he was pretty shaken up over it. Um, but you know, he you know, credit to him, Elder Summer, like he got back on, you know, on on the horse, as they say, and he he was an awesome missionary after that. So he didn't let that stop him. I think he was shaking for a little bit, but um, he was he was a solid missionary, man. He was awesome. Wow. That's that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing, like, the things that we encounter. I mean, you, you think about it, right? Just young 20-year-old kids just roaming the freaking streets, and, you know, you, you never know who you're coming across. And, my goodness, like, you – logically, it doesn't make any sense at all, but – you know what I mean? Like you, you have a job to do and you're there to, to <laughs> share the gospel. And, and, uh, sometimes you, you pay the price, you know what I mean? But, but yeah, it's wild. I got, a. I want to show Alec a picture for, to remind him of something, but I just did find uh -oh. that. So, look at these two hoodlums. I mean, what's this? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, gee, <laughs> oh my gosh, bro! You need to send me these pictures, man. I haven't seen. Oh my gosh! Oh, oh that was classic. But, you know, we also we also thought you know we were like good football players. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! Oh my! We used to, uh, you know, every every Saturday we used to play uh, football with the local Neds just to try to, you know just have some type of like face recognition there. And, and, uh, one, actually the, um, the, the mission leader, oh no, the, uh, the ward mission leader, his son, like he ran with a bunch of the, of the local Neds. And so we play football with him every, every Saturday. And it was more like, you know, cause you know, Karish and Albert were pretty big guys and obviously Karish was a lot taller than me, but we used to play like really rough, like soccer with these kids, man. And so we would just, I mean, it was, it was basically rugby when we went out there and played, it was, <laughs> it was awesome. And so we, we gained the respect pretty, pretty quickly there. And uh, yeah, we, you know, we had our, our Celtic and, and our Ranger outfits on. And so it was, it was awesome, man. You guys oh my probably God. fit in just perfectly then. Oh dude, it was, it was so much fun. Like, yeah, we had, we had way too much fun out there. But yeah, man, it was, uh, just, just one of those things where, um, we had, we had just too much fun out there and, uh, let, let's tell one, one story. I don't want to hijack your, your podcast brother. Cause this is kind of your, your time to shine. Uh, so I'm trying to find, and maybe it's even too inappropriate to share. <laughs> yes. the, Cause it, I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty gnarly. So is it your toe. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I have it. So Gil and I, we also went fishing one day with an investigator and uh, the investigator, I think his name was Steve, Steve, but he was a chiropodist or the equivalent of podiatrist. My dad's a podiatrist, a foot doctor. I had these awful ingrown toenails that were the worst you'd ever seen, but refused mm -hmm. to like not work and so just always go and work and it was just awful but that it was almost uh i don't think we we're ever close to baptizing that guy but at least he took us fly fishing uh once and we you know taught him a lesson there and we i yeah. it was the first time i had really done much fishing at all and caught this huge rainbow trout it was like a stocked pond uh but and that <laughs> that thing for whatever dumb reason i don't even know why but we had it in our freezer forever. You remember that? <laughs> yeah, dude. 
Yeah. Why would we, we ever cook it? Fish in our freezer. I can't remember if we cooked it or not, but yeah, get, carriage had, I mean, th- this ingrown toe, oh my goodness, it was, it was gnarly. And, uh, Oh my gosh, dude! You have the best freaking pictures. Look at that, man! But yeah, that's, that's the. Nice. Oh, I I got. I mean, you guys are an hour ahead of me, so you know I don't want to keep you guys here forever. But uh, you know we could just go on. Gilmore is going to completely forget about this guy. Okay, this guy's name's Eddie, and uh, I asked him. He's all. Uh, we 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 were seeing him in the streets quite often. He's from Uganda. And he was super excited. Uh, I know Eddie, dude. Yeah, he was super excited. He came up and because he got like he was trying to say he got like a new car, and it was like, "What are you talking about? You don't have a car." And he's all he referred the to Jaguar. His, yeah, but he referred to his shoes as a Futsubishi, like he got a Mitsubishi. <laughs> but here's our boy Eddie that we oh would my, see on a yeah, P day. I think dude. we went and played basketball with him. We did. Yeah, he That's... was. He was. He was a character. <laughs> yeah, and, and Eddie, like he, like he so badly wanted to, you know, make his way to America, because he thought like in America, like everyone has Jaguars and Bentleys and all this stuff, and he just like he, you know, he's from Uganda, so he's just like, I need to go to America, and and, and you guys would get me to America. We're like, hey man, we, we can't. There's nothing we can do to help you out. Like I don't know what you, you know, you want from us, but <laughs> uh, he, uh, yeah, he was a character, brother. His character. Um, this was some of our less active work with Prince Pride and Enoch. Oh, I think man. Prince and I think Prince and Pride were members, right? Yeah, Prince and Pride were were members. Um, Enoch, he was that you know eternal investigator, but um, <laughs> yeah, they it, it was weird because they they didn't have like I mean they were young kids too, was sixteen, seventeen years old, but they were like living on their own. And uh, we go up there and, and teach them and, and try to get them reactivated and stuff like that. And they always had, I, I loved it because they always like were playing Tupac or, or, or Biggie and, you know, weren't not supposed to listen to that music. So I'm like, hey, let's go, let's go see what Prince and Pride are doing. And then, you know, get, give me the opportunity to listen to Tupac. We all had those experiences where you're like, oh. No, you don't have to turn it off. This is fun. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yep, exactly right. So, anyway, and and uh, and, and Kara shot to convert me to the country many times out there, and and uh, never worked. So, sorry, brother. Hi. I'm still. I'm not. I'm but not I mean, anti-country. The, the thing but. about the the thing about country though is, it was all philosophical because I didn't have any of that propaganda evil stuff. I didn't have like any <laughs> of the music, right? So it was like. <laughs> It was just discussions. It wasn't like, here, let's listen to some country music. Yeah, exactly. But <laughs> that influenced anyway. me though, because I asked, I asked Kenton, or I was like, all right, I think I asked all my companions, what's one album I should buy when I get home? And he's like, you got to get the Garth Brooks Double Live album. <laughs> yeah. So when I got home, I bought it, and I listened, <laughs> I listened to the heck out of that thing, man. Yeah, I only listened to the there's a Garth Brooks song I had that I listened to with Elder Cooper. I think maybe when it's a zone lead or not, but it was actually somewhat impactful for me. It was the the song A Dream is Like a River. Mm, it's a good one. Right. Um I did listen to mostly your podcast, Alec, and I there's there's uh there's something that you had not touched on, and I'm, I saw this picture here earlier, so I'm going to see if I can get it. Um, I know you talked about that crazy guy who put his finger through an apple, which was nuts. <laughs> there was... Uh, that wasn't Brother Stevens, though, right? That Brother Stevens no. was another crazy guy. No, he he, he was the guy that had the uh, that, that old Bible like on an altar in the middle of his living room. And, uh, yeah. He had all types of like incense, and he had like uh, like hundreds of like crucifixes all throughout his his uh, his his apartment or his flat. And we're like, "What the heck is going on?" And he just he just really like awful feeling. Like the second we walk in there, just I don't know. It was, it was, I mean, all the flats we go in there, like you know, it's always like dim. You know, it's, it's, it's you can barely see what's going on and. Just the whole ambiance of everything is like, man, this is this is kind of weird. But 
there was one guy, the only time I've ever really kind of been scared. Do you remember Brother Malin? Of course, John. Absolutely. Yeah, he's like uh, he's the only one who I was like, Gilmore, we're not going back to this guy because he's just creepy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I would say that the Shawlands witch was she was always creepy. John Mallon was really creepy, uh, but I, I think I think Brother Stever or Stevens was to me was the creepiest one because just I mean, yeah, I, I thought uh, I thought he'd he'd do some crazy. <laughs> There's uh, so. Us. This is some inappropriate, maybe contact or touching. We'll let we'll let Zach and Bryce uh, say yay or nay. But this is the this is the only person Gilmore told me we're not seeing anymore. It was my my Scottish grandma. <laughs> you remember her? <laughs> she was like in Thornley Bank. <laughs> oh my gosh, dude! You, you oh. remember her, right? She was nice. She, yeah. But there I, came I, a time where we were wasting time going to see her, right? Yeah. Oh, I mean, that was like 90% of our, our contacts, man. Like, <laughs> 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 yeah, dude. I don't uh, know, man. So, anyway. Gil didn't talk about these people. I did. Are the, the, the three Ar Iranians? Yeah. Did you? Maybe I, you know, maybe I wasn't paying attention. Uh, you know, I got hairy hands, hairy, you know, bushy eyebrows and probably looked like an Iranian. So we, we came in contact with these Iranian people and became like, they would always want to see us. You know, I think legitimately, I think Hussein Kabizi, that's who we had baptized, that mm -hmm. he was, he was genuine. He, you know, was converted to Christianity in that regard. Um, and this is also me looking back, you know, 20 years and not saying uh, that I think he had false motives because I don't think he had false motives. But it could have also been for some asylum that he would be able asylum. to stay if he was baptized. But I, he was he was legitimate and had, you know, a conversion, which was which was nice. And then for a while we and I could say this wrong for a while. Uh, they had taught us some Farsi yeah. and when Gilmore and I would go tracting or uh, not tracting GQing and I would see, you know, we would have Farsi Book of Mormons and I would yep. see, uh, you know, an Iranian or someone and they would say no. And then right when we passed them, I would turn my head and, and I would say, Hafiz, which means I think like uh, God bless you or something. And then they'd be yeah. all like, alarmed and think that you could speak farsi and then they would come back and then come we would back talk and to start. them and then we would join them to our pool <laughs> yeah. yeah dude yeah they they were they were solid man they and, they um had, they had really i mean if, if they ever got sent back to iran you know remember when they showed us that video like what would happen to them if they got sent back and they converted over like it was it was awful um yeah and they had they had crazy faith and I, I do think that initially it was to seek asylum but as as we taught and as as we got more like entrenched in the spirit like they had a at least i thought that a true testimony of, of the gospel and the massive faith of those guys you know stepping into the waters and yeah it was great man that was one of my favorite stories of all time it's awesome there was there was another iranian or persian family that we met and uh I remember one time, maybe this was when, uh, maybe the good Lord was making sure we were well fed or something, but I remember Gilmore and I like, let's go, let's go and, you know, knock on these people door. And, uh, we did, but the whole purpose is because we knew we were going to be fed and we showed up and they treated, they always treated us like royalty, but this family literally had their, like son or someone from texas that would, had just flown in after being like on flights forever and it would have been the most inconvenient thing ever but they just you know came and <laughs> made us a bunch of food so yeah. they were you know that that community was really good those people they were i'll, I'll tell one more story and I'll, I'll hop off here um but remember when we went to uh to mini bangladesh and we decided to just go tracking in like that all Muslim area 
and we got like reamed from that the older gentleman. Oh, yeah. Remember that? Oh, and he's yeah. like, he's like, you guys killed your prophet. You killed your prophet. And we're like, we didn't do anything. It wasn't us, you know. And yeah. and uh, but I I remember like I, I look back at it, dude. We were that was crazy for us to go. I mean, we literally were knocking on doors of these of of these Muslim, you know, friends of ours. But my goodness, like. We could have gotten some real trouble. Oh, but. the the area was Queens Park, right? Queens Park, yep. And uh, you might remember in that area too. I had a small fixation because one of the days we knocked on uh, a door, and someone there had family that owned the Seven Elevens in Reno, Nevada. And I mm -hmm. kind of grew up in Reno, Nevada, and so we're like, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> it's a sign we did go over there and make sure we're, you know getting this guy because i'm from reno and was sent here to to get him but they uh i i there's we'll let you go but that's that was that's that was it that oh my gosh dude that, but on the on the other side they had and i had the picture where it says christ died for your sin because it was it was literally like crossing a, a national border in between yeah. like the the two different communities but i kind of bait and switched i think i remember what you're talking about with that the cleric the muslim cleric because yep like he literally got his broom and was like yep. suing us out of there but so we had spent enough time and and knew about uh islam and about you know modesty and covering you know women covering up and uh and so we were we were outside of a shop and I vividly baited him and said, well, you know, tell me about why they cover up. And he tells me, and it's all about modesty. And I said, well, how come you sell all this pornography all right here? Because they had all the nudie magazines. And that's when he really got ticked and he got pissed. kicked us out of there. Like, so. Yeah. And <laughs> like before, before we left, I don't know if you remember, but we had that exchange. Uh, that lady gave us the Quran and we gave her a Book of Mormon in exchange. And I actually yeah. had that. I had that crown with me when I went to the, uh, when I became AP and I, and I, I left it in the uh, office. I, I, I should have brought it home with me, but it was like an old Quran. It was, it was awesome, but yeah, good, good times, good times. But anyway, gentlemen, it was, it was, it was fun. It was fun catching up with you guys, man. This is awesome, man. Professionally, you're my favorite person on earth, brother. Love you very much, dude. Love you too. You need to text me more. Slacker. <laughs> <laughs> my my wife will say the exact same thing. Trust me, she uh, she hates when I don't text back. But <laughs> <laughs> all right, gentlemen, take care. Uh, Love you guys. Thanks, Alex. Right. Yeah. Yep. Bye. Oh, great. Excellent. All right. Well, we'll do things a little out of order here, but it's all good. Yeah. So, two thousand. Four, you went home. Did you go home to Utah or Nevada? I went. So when I was 18 months old, my parents were divorced. I moved to Salt Lake City. That's where my mom uh, grew up. And so I grew up there, but always went and, and saw my dad, you know, summers and things like that. A little bit later, maybe when I was seven or eight ish is when more visits started happening. My brother, who's 18 months older than me, he uh decided to go to school at UNR it's University of Nevada Reno uh so he went out there and um since he went out there and when I came back I just that felt like the place that I should go and so I kind of the summer and then uh enrolled in school and started what started going to UNR in the fall of 2004 2004 thanks cool and you know, run us through what you've been up to since then a little bit. People want to know what, what's cash. It, it's it's kind of shocking, but when, if you're, you know, so programmed to do all the things that you were supposed to do, it seemed like it took a long time to find, you know, who your companion should be that you were almost preordained to meet. But, you know, I, looking back at it, it was still like super fast. I mean, I was married within two years, so I got married uh, met my wife uh, through, I became one of my good friends that I had met uh, in Reno. 
uh, going to school and through the institute there at, at UNR, he was dating a girl, uh, and that girl would have been my wife, Kristen's sister. And so had got to know the sisters. She comes from a real big family, but she would have still been at that point, I think our senior year in high school. Uh, and maybe it was like after a year when then she had graduated and then started doing, you know, going to school, uh, you know, just, I guess one thing led to another and that's who I met and dated and got married. So got married in what, July of 2006 and, uh, went to UNR. I had a real, uh, I owned a business for a short period of time. It was a floor restoration company uh, that you would uh, clean and seal hardwood services, mostly like stone. Uh, now it's pretty common for that type of work to, to be done. Uh, and most of it's done through like a carpet cleaning type of company. Uh, but then I decided I didn't want to do business where I had to go into other people's environment. And at that point, I had, for whatever reason, thought maybe I would want to go to law school. So I think I had, had been in college for about four years then. And then uh, ended up graduating in 2009 uh, with a degree in communications and minor business and applied to a bunch of schools. Uh, and that's a long story in and of itself of how I ended up deciding to go to a school called Mississippi College. It's kind of like the Southern Baptist version of BYU, but it's a lot smaller. But they're they're kind of a lead school for the Southern Baptist Convention, and they do like a lot. Of, they will do run a lot of the like high school curriculum for some of the private high schools. Uh, but I got into a dual degree program there. So I did a, a MBA and a JD at the same time. Uh, and then when I finished there, I, we decided to move back to Reno to Nevada. And what was good about going and doing higher education is the, you know, let's face it. I think more often than not, people would call it a nightmare uh but let's be a little bit more nice about it when you have the dream that you're back on your mission right you're like why am i back here like i did this and leave me alone and this is not happening so law school from all of that stress and anxiety kind of took over those dreams i would still have mission dreams but that's kind of interesting how law school and that process you know overcame you know those uh, dreams would have of being on a mission uh, I came back, my first job out of law school, I worked for the University of Nevada, Reno. I wrote contracts for research. A lot of them would deal with like mice and, and medical type of things where one professor would need, would collaborate with a third party to do some type of a research project. Uh, we're close to Lake Tahoe. And so there's a lot on invasive uh, clams and animals that they have up there. So do some contracts with that. And I also did um, worked with people who were donating money to the university through like plant giving through like a will or a trust and then did the, what would you say, nonprofit compliance for the, the school's foundation. Uh, from there, I took a job uh, it's kind of weird. I wanted to stay there and I would have, but I was going into a full-time. So I was kind of doing two part-time jobs equaling a full-time job. And I was going to do full-time contracts, but in like a final budget revision, they didn't, they took out that additional full-time and they kept it part-time. So we had already given a bunch of the, the nonprofit compliance stuff to another law firm in town. So that work, you know, had been, farmed out to somebody else so i then went and got a job at a firm in las vegas i uh, did social security disability uh it was a plaintiff's law firm i wasn't there too long because my wife Kristen, she really liked her job she's still been in the same job and i was flying a lot she was still in reno and i was flying back and forth a lot and then i applied to a job in reno and got it in the market coming out of law school for you know, when I graduated 2012, 
it was just really awful. I mean, it was awful for everyone, but for the recession for white collar jobs, I guess you'd call it white collar. I don't really think of it that way, but it was, it was really hard. So in jobs in Reno were hard to find, but got that. And sadly that was the worst job I ever had. Uh, and then I got lucky and went and worked uh, f- for some district court judges uh, locally. So I was what's called like a judicial law clerk, someone who writes opinions and does research and stuff for for judges. And then uh, and that was with family court judges. And then since that time, I've primarily just done uh, mostly like family law oriented legal work. Like currently, I do. So when you say family law, you know, divorce, custody, minor guardianships, adult guardianships. Um, I have a really sad pro bono case that I offer to do for free of a family that just got um, gunned down by one of their kids. And there's just a three-year-old girl left. And so, you know, that would be like kind of a minor guardianship. That's That stuff can be kind of sad. But I also do, uh, I have a license in Utah and I'm doing... Uh, representing people who are what we would call an intended parent who are hiring a surrogate to carry a child for them. So that's mostly all like contracts. And so I will either represent surrogates or represent parents. uh, And that's really good work uh, that I like because you're helping people accomplish something and build a family. Uh, My wife and I, which is not fully my story to tell, but took quite a bit longer for us to have kids. We have twins and I had my own uh, journey of having to use modern medicine uh, to be able to, you know, be able to procreate. So, you know, I have personal experience in there. So, you know, what William and Layla, that's the name of my kids. They were born November 14th, 2019. Uh, And they're, they're four and a half. Um, And so I, I see that about covers it pretty quickly there. So cool. Yeah, that's great. Man. And hands full with those twins, it sounds like. <laughs> yeah, it's it's probably, I expected a lot, but it's probably more work than I expected. I mean, I, I maybe hope every parent thinks or says that, right? <laughs> I think most do. Most do. If we knew, right? It's it's just like the mission, right? If you knew what you're getting into, you might not sign up. So yeah, you're just going to go for it. Very good. <clears throat> That's that's great to hear about that journey and where you're at now. And so, you know, now let's go back and we'll start at the beginning of the mission. So I luckily I just have about everything uh from the mission. I even have my nice little card here that would be like on the board, right? I don't know if you guys remember having them or if you have them. Um it's somewhere mine's lost somewhere i know it's somewhere but. i my first area was the orkney islands so i was there for four and a half months i was there with elder terence Stig, stiglitz uh stiglitz i think he was gone he, he for sure was gone before either of you had got to the mission did you ever hear any stories about him he was on the podcast recently and shared with us so you'll have to catch that one kenton <laughs> Did but, he yeah. say? Did he say anything about me on there? Of course he did. He he loved serving with you. He <laughs> he just absolutely loved you. Glowing reviews. But yes, he, we, uh, we've he heard was plenty banished, of stories. Yeah, he was banished to the islands for headbutting a net on the bus. <laughs> yeah, we we I I was privileged enough to speak with him and hear that story firsthand, and it was glorious in in every sense of the word. <laughs> yeah, you know, if you were ever frustrated with someone smoking on the bus, no one smoked when he was on the bus. I recall a time I literally take a, a cigarette out of a mouth and stomp it out on the bus. Um, he was, who knows what the truth of it is, but he was maybe like an amateur rugby player. I also played rugby in high school. So we we got along from that, but he was a really quiet guy. There was a time where there was this crazy farmer that came out and was was threatening i had to de-escalate it because i think you know at that point you know he came out with some type of a a weapon that looked like a weapon and elder steglitz i mean he was going to have none of it but we we de-escalated and (laughs) 
uh, we kind of left, but in, in the Orkney Islands, well, let me tell you, so um, I grew up in Utah, in Reno, uh, Salt Lake City. Reno's a bit uh, lighter, you know, Brown Mountains and what Salt Lake would be. I never really thought like we really lived in a desert till we landed in England. It was like, <laughs> it was a big shock. Uh, and I remember from the Preston MTC and going to Edinburgh, when I got out of the, the, the train station, there was a whiskey distillery place right close by there and that they were producing that day. And I, I had no idea what it was, but I was so naive. I was like, is this what a foreign country smells like? Cause this is just awful. Cause the <laughs> smell was just like so bad. Uh, and I, I guess I kind of also say that because, you know, primarily, let's say Salt Lake 20 years ago, about a million people, then going to, you know, the Orkney Islands Kirkwall with like 4,000 in its main city was a pretty big, pretty big shock. Uh, yeah. And I, I was there four and a half months and literally knocked on every single door on the main island. Uh, so that's an objective that I was able to accomplish. And we took a ferry once to a little smaller island. I don't know. This was, I don't think this was with Elder Steglitz. I think it was with Elder Holopine and uh, who's one of my favorites, but we met a shaman medicine man who we were so excited when we were sharing the first vision story and the, and the tree of life and story. And he was all getting interested in it. And then he, he said, okay, it's my turn. How about I tell you that you can have the same experience. And he invited us to go and do uh you know, a nighttime drum ceremony with the the it's the ring of Bodgar, Bodgar or something. You know, the standing stones. Yeah, we didn't take them up on it. Maybe now I would think that would have been pretty cool. But uh, <laughs> yeah, no, that, you know, know, did either of you ever serve on any of the islands? I served in Orkney. Oh, did you? Yeah, All I right. was I was there for a short short stint. Yeah. Well, I wasn't there in the winter, thank goodness. I was, unfortunately. So everyone who talks about running through the green yeah. fields, you know, like the sound of music, I didn't have that experience in Orkney, unfortunately. <laughs> what about, did you still do work for uh, the member who was super old? I think he passed away, but he had a brother who was a farmer. He had a pig farm. Did you still do work on there? Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. That's why you and I are instantly best friends before we ever met. Because <laughs> that's right, man. Orkney, uh, you know, if anything, that was probably the most humbling experience being there, and you know, just the taste of probably the hardest missionary work. But there's no really way to describe it. And I also, growing up, I didn't think that it would like it was a real thing if people were seasick, like on a boat, that they should be like paint like their faces would be green. But one time <laughs> going over the pass, it was so bad that every, and I lost Elder Hall of Pinin, but everyone's face like looked at just olive green. I was like, it's real. I mean, that's, that's real seasickness. Yeah. That boat ride was not fun. I can tell you. Yeah. <laughs> Thankfully I only had to do it one time and I'll yeah. count my stars that I was lucky that it was only once. It was yeah. so bad. So Elder Stiglitz was great. Um, you know, it was good to have, other than him, you know, being a real quiet person, he just wanted to work really hard. Uh, I had Elder Holopine in next. Elder Holopine, and I keep in touch with him the most, and then probably uh, Gilmore Holopine, and he's also an attorney in Finland. Uh, cool. And I remember when his family would send him the black licorice candy, it would just smell our whole apartment up forever. And I didn't like black licorice. <laughs> but Elder Elder Hall of Pine, and there's two funny things about him. One, he had one of the best proselyting tactics. Maybe it was slightly manipulative, but it was real effective. Uh, he would knock on the door, and people would answer, and he would say, "Hi, we're missionaries. Can we come inside, please?" And most people would be like, "Oh, sure." Before they even know who you are or what you're doing, you're in the you're in the door, right? And, then, <laughs> and it could be like uh, a bit of an awkward uh, moment, but he he was really good. I was with him for just six weeks. Uh, he was my zone leader later, but he was one of my one of my favorites, uh, favorite companions, and still friends to this day. Uh, I could go on and on and on about Orkney, but 
Uh, I really want to go back there one day. Um, it was a great place. It was, it was, I mean, the only thing that you maybe missed out when it was green is when they would spray the fields with all the manure. And that was like a really bad smell. You probably didn't get that in the winter, but yeah, <laughs> no. you would. Oh man. Um, <laughs> from there, uh, I got, I went to Canvas Lane. Did anyone ever serve in Canvas Lane? No. Uh, Canvas Lang is part, it was part of Glasgow. It had some famous, uh, areas like it had the Gorbals. Did you ever hear of the Gorbals? Mm -hmm. So uh, they've been destroyed, but we, that was in our area. They also had this place called the circus, uh, which really was a circus. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I think it was Elder Dunn who was my companion. I can't recall, but I remember we were in the circus. It was a bunch of high flats and, uh, we were, we we're getting something from uh, a shop that was kind of close by and a bunch of Neds ran in and said, I think was the term CID for like special. Yeah. yeah so they'd be like, are you, you CID? And we knew better than to like, you know, you either say that or you, you just try to change the topic just so they don't know your missionaries. And the, the shop owner said, no, they're Jesus people. And I was like, Oh, great. This is <laughs> so Jesus we, people. the second, we opened the door and this was around Guy Fox night time period. The second we opened the door, they fired a mortar shell firework that went in direct hit to the window. And I, I saw it coming. I ducked, put my backpack over and then, you know, just huge thing. The shop owner of course got mad. And then I think we just like out of that, just, just went out the door and just ran as fast as we could. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But I had I had Elder Man. Elder Man was Patrick Man. Did he has he ever been on the podcast? You hear of him at all? I've heard his name, but he hasn't been on the podcast yet. He was so he was the first one who educated me on what a tea book is. I have a tea book. Did it, did that still like stay? Did it go through? Did people still have tea books? Many people did. Zach and I did not, but it definitely so, is a tradition. Yes, it definitely. So Patrick, he was he was very he's a real personable guy. And I don't have, you know, I'll leave it at that. Um he did, I mean, he would probably like to spend more time making a tea book really cool than maybe hitting the streets hard. <laughs> So, you know, there that's him. I think he, he's the one that made that, and this was in our zone. There was an, a Will Rogers. Did you any of you know Will Rogers, or was he on the podcast at all? Not yet. I've heard of him. I, I've heard his name. So, like, this was just awful, but when I'm first, you know, like the first week there, Rogers and his companion was coming over, and uh, Patrick, <laughs> they walk up the stairs and he has like an airsoft BB gun before like there's airsoft gun. So it's just more like a hard plastic thing. And he just starts shooting Rogers like with all the, with the BBs, it was like bad harassment, but you know, that was just kind of my <laughs> first, my first like shock to, you know, maybe there's people who are not like Stiglitz who's just going to be working super hard and that's all that matters. Right. There's this little bit of more mischief. Uh <laughs> And it was kind of hard. I mean, Patrick, he was really, he was really personable. But then after that is when I uh, got called to train Rich Dunn, right? And so you have an area that's not maybe been worked too well, not a lot going on. And then you're like off to train. I was with um, Patrick Mann, Elder Mann for just like six weeks. But uh, Elder Dunn probably would have told you, well, he did tell you, I played soccer with him. Yeah. And I knew, I knew he was getting, that he was coming out. And so I was pretty shocked that, um, he became my companion. Uh, you know, who knows? I can't say like president Wilkinson really would have known much to like really put us together. What's, what's bad. What rich, I don't think he said, cause I listened to some of the podcast. I got an injury, uh, when we were playing soccer and I lost my starting spot to him and then I never got it back. 
So always like by starting, you know, what varsity. <laughs> so that was always like a little bit disappointed, but then I also played rugby. And so I just went and played rugby on the team for that season and just kind of quit the soccer team. But I feel I've apologized to Rich two or three times. And I at least talk to him maybe once a year. And when we say talk like text messages, but hmm. I was just like, too much of a disciplinarian and he didn't say it on the podcast but so one time he was hungry and he just wanted to get a banana but it wasn't p day and i wouldn't let him go to the shop to buy a banana right so <laughs> you know Dang, it, was, it, was, it, it was it was it was bad but you know again too i think i was out i was out six months uh and that was pretty early for training so you know i i don't know you know just <laughs> trying to be as obedient as you can. And I later apologized to him for that uh, while we were, you know, companions. But I think I was probably a little too hard on him, but I think there was probably too much pressure on me. So. Uh, happens, uh, happens to the best of us as trainers. You, you become a different person when the mission president says, you're going to shape this elder's entire mission and you go okay and there's a rod that goes up your backside a little bit oh yeah you straighten up and yeah. it's, it's a tough time it's hard but i mean that's how steglitz would have you know also trained me too like no mercy so <laughs> um you know i don't know what i would imagine we'd run out of time quickly but did you i don't know if you how far these made it but like the enzyme of honor all your little stats oh my gosh did you have these, or is this mostly a Wilkinson deal? It was mostly Wilkinson. I think it phased out either shortly before I got there, or I may have done like one or two when I because, like, I, I was looking at these before you know, first time in 20 plus years. Um, but you know, I'm doing like 30 hours of chapping a week, like on average, and you know, five to eight GQing, so it was just you know, just. If you weren't working, then my brain was telling me I wasn't doing what I was supposed to. Like with my feet, uh, the pictures would just be disgusting. But uh, <laughs> so I feel bad uh, with with Elder Dunn. But I, you know, he doesn't remember it as bad, or at least he's not honest with me. Um, <laughs> yeah, I from. He and I had rocks thrown at us too by a net. Nets. The canvas lane was a pretty bad spot. It was also a real older community. And I kind of falsely got like a stronger belief in the word of wisdom because there was maybe also myths or legends that women who drink like a lot of tea would get facial hair or something. And like everyone who walked down like on the main street were old and it was lots of ladies and they just always like had almost beards i mean not beards but you know a lot of <laughs> facial hair and so i kind of maybe took that a little too far uh <laughs> that's great elder france i mean he's about the number one character and i think i heard someone talk about him his name was ezra but i don't think anyone knows anything about him Do we know anything about ezra france we not haven't, we haven't caught up with him i would he I would was like a, to have him on I think uh, Elder Cooley trained him. He was uh, he was a logger. Yeah, I I went to Livingston after Canvas Lane, uh, and I was called as a district leader according to this, you know, rap sheet. And uh, Elder France, he was he had a guitar. He liked to play his guitar, and he just kind of went according to his, you know, he beat his own drum, and so just did the best to keep the peace. I was just with him for six weeks. I know he loved to get his fish and chips, uh, his haddock, and you know he had this big jacket, and you know he'd wipe his hands on it, and that would always drive me nuts because I would just see all this grease going all over his, <laughs> his jacket. Uh, he was he was our district leader. Your last oh, six weeks, really? Yeah, I remember that now. Me, me and you. Me and you. He was he was the district leader up in uh oh man, what's the name of the little town north of us? But yeah. So I Elder Hall of Pine and I'm in Livingston. Did either of you serve in Livingston? No. 
Livingston was kind of like a, just an outskirt city, probably more affordable housing in between Glasgow and Edinburgh. It's kind of like a little triangle in the middle in Livingston. And it was, it was newer, but Livingston, Elder Hall of Pinen was my zone leader then. And I, I kept, uh, I didn't want to read through any of my journals at all because this could all, uh, some of this stuff could be verified, but I, I got super sick at a fever. It was, you know, well over 102. It was just really bad and it wouldn't go away. Elder Hall kind of gave me a blessing and literally, and I was like holding off, holding off. That was like the last thing I would do. Literally after he gave me a blessing, my fever broke uh, and I was, you know, it was kind of like a, a mini, mini miracle there for me. But at the same time, I was, I was pretty sick with that fever not going away. And it would have been sister Wilkinson made me go to the doctor's office. And this is when I was with elder France. Uh, and it was not like, you know, the best companionship. And I had gone to the doctor, you know, nothing special, you know, at that point I'm just getting over whatever it was. And I'm on the bus and I hear this voice as if someone were literally speaking to me. And it's like one of the only things in life I cannot explain whatsoever. And it's as if someone's whispering in my ear and it says, Elder Davis is going to be your companion. Because we were, you know, the, what, transfers were coming up in a week. I'm like, not a chance. I've been here three months. I had six weeks with, uh, I've had just six weeks with France uh davis you know i've known him since you know i was young we came out together i've never seen like people who came out at the same time to be companions and uh president wilkinson knew that we were friends from back back home but the voice was so specific i wrote it down in a journal i have tapes here uh from my mission so it's it'll be here so example like this one Elder Karish and Davis, it was, a t it was a tape that we would send back and forth, just, you know, saying what's going on, you know, in the areas, just, just chatting. And I, I sent him on the tape and said, I'm going to be your companion. I wrote in my journal, Elder Davis is going to be my companion. I wrote home and said, Elder Davis is going to be my companion. And transfers that time uh, took quite, it was, you know, I think we were the last ones that were called. In fact, I, we were. And President Wilkinson called and he said, Elder Karish, I have rearranged the board three different times this evening. And every single time I've rearranged the board, it has you and Elder Davis being companions. And I know you're friends, but I'm not rearranging this board again. Do not screw this up. I don't know why you're supposed to be companions, but you're going to be companions. <laughs> and so literally, you know, at least when you would say, you know, is there some documented evidence or something? One of the only things in my life I cannot explain by reason or anything. I heard a voice that said, Elder Davis is going to be your companion. And he was my companion. Um, and that still, I don't want to say haunts me, but it always, it's just something I can't, I can't comprehend. Uh, Elder, we, we, uh, we worked hard. Uh, and at the same time, like, Let's let's assume that Bishop Monson told the mission president we're coming on a trip to Scotland because that's what happened. Uh, and this was also when we had just been out a year. And remember, his birthday is April twenty seventh, and his mind's April thirtieth. And we were companions over our birthday. And my bishop came over and got permission from the mission president, and we went you know touring for like a day which was scary because they were driving and we almost got <laughs> a wreck. But let's just assume like, let's assume it was all rigged and, you know, Bob called and said, I want you to make them companions, companions and everything. That does not explain like at a low moment in my mission where I hear an audible voice in my ear telling me that Elder Davis is going to be my companion. And I write him and I put it on a tape. Um, you know, and for how fast things travel, like my family got the letter, you know, after we had been called companions, but it was in the mail. 
So, <laughs> you know, that's, yeah. that's, that's something I, you know, it, it is pretty crazy to me. Um, Elder Davis and I, we were only six weeks, uh, which was probably good. <laughs> probably for my diet too, because we pulled all of our money together and bought like the best foods we could. <laughs> so uh, we also uh, made up a song uh, called pasta dish that we would sing that we would sing as we would uh, go knocking on doors. And, you know, I'm not going to sing the song here, but oh, come on, pretty, Kenton, come on. <laughs> a couple bars. Let me, yeah. let me, ho- we'll see. Uh, yes <laughs> but even you know yeah it was a, it was a pretty good song which was also nice is because i was my friend's senior companion and district leader right so i was serving it up to him you know like <laughs> i'm your superior <laughs> you listen to me <laughs> um i went from there to go work in the mission home with elder erickson um Elder Erickson, it was Trevor Erickson. He was a, I was with him for four and a half months. He was a tank commander, uh, an Abrams tank commander uh, before he came out on the mission. He was very strong personality. He and I will still sometimes uh, send text messages uh, together. He always uh, had an agenda, like any type of meeting, he would hold his finger up like this. And, you know, we knew it was Erickson's agenda. But at that time we had, probably one of the most cohesive zones uh, where we had Elder Cooley and Elder Croshaw and also Elder Ames uh, that were there at that time in the office. And we, we created the Edinburgh pipe band. And I'm sad that Cooley didn't talk about the Edinburgh pipe band. Uh, did he didn't talk about the pipe band, did he? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty disturbing to me that he didn't because we even performed uh, at the request of the mission home, uh, the pipe band. And I'm pretty sure I had a picture of it. So let me. <laughs> yeah, I'm shocked they didn't bring it up. So I'm glad that you have your book of record for us, Kenton. Yeah. He... Derek will listen to this and he'll go, oh, my gosh. Did he really yeah, just say I mean, it? He's... It's shocking that he didn't. Um... I don't even remember why what this little thing was where we did the the edinburgh pipe band but the, so this would have been this is not the pipe band but when we were at the mission home cooking something for some type of an event so that was erickson next to me and cooley and uh jeff croshaw uh but the the edinburgh pipe band it's not you know we had a drummer and we had the guy who would be the marcher and cool uh elder cooley and i we were the bagpipes and it's i don't think it's like you know it's not that too novel but you know if you put your you close your nose and go <laughs> like that right so cool and i did that and you had crochet i think on the drums and someone else being the baton to, uh you know guy <laughs> so and it got a, a big kick out of a lot of people. You know, looking back at it, you 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 feel pretty foolish, but whatever. Um, I love we it. did. There was there was a family like on my mission. You go to Pratt's Hill. There was a family. My my whole agenda on the mission was to try to baptize a family, and uh, to a certain extent, we did that. It, you know. And there was a family uh, that was baptized, uh, a, f- a father, not the wife, but his name was Steve. And we had a, a wedding at the um, mission home and his wife, Mandy, uh, she never got baptized, but she, you know, was nice to missionaries. But then they had twins who were baptized. And I think, well, I know both of the twin, the girls, they had married uh, return missionaries, and I still keep in contact with them. Unfortunately, their mom, who was super nice, she passed away a couple of years back in a in an accident, oh, wow. and so it's, that's kind of really sad um, hmm. with that. But that was probably the highlight, at least, of my mission was seeing that family. And you look at it, 
and I think their lives are substantially better off from, you know, the husbands that they have met. One of the the one of the twins married a guy who is now also a lawyer, so that's uh, kind of fun. Where it's kind of in the same, yeah. You know. Um, I got lucky. So when Sister Wilkinson left the mission home. She gave me her collection of coins. It was just like a last minute thing. She didn't want to pack or whatever, but it was quite a bit of money. And she's like, here, you just take it. So that was like our, our Greg's fund, you know, the bakery for yes. six weeks. And so Cooley and everyone would give me a hard time if I didn't buy Greg's because I got all the free money uh, from Sister <laughs> That's so good. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Uh, just so you know, Behind me, that corner, that's where that uh, firework got shot. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> to hit us. So that was not cool. That's crazy. Man. I So what? After, um, that's when I had Elder Thomas after Erickson in the mission office. And I really liked, I really liked being companions with Sean. He was on the podcast. I listened to that. Um, did any of you know Elder? Uh, did either of you know him else, like in the mission? He, he was oh. older, older than me. Say that again. Sean was a little bit older than my time okay. in the mission, so uh, I'm just a wee Bobby. This, uh, so that was uh, my bishop, President Monson's brother, and his wife, Laura. When they came to see us, spitting image. Yeah, they look pretty. They pr look pretty similar, but he, you know, he's still alive. He was a character. Like he, he took that, uh, you know, priest basketball league pretty serious, and he even got ejected uh, from being our coach while he was <laughs> for being a little too, too rambunctious. So. Oh, here we go. Here we go. That was the pipe band in action. <laughs> yeah, that's uh looks like actually Cooley. I was doing the I was playing the pipes, but Cooley at that time he was the one doing the little trick I was showing you. <laughs> Oh gosh. Yeah. That's... And then, so this is 100% not serious. Uh, well, I guess you also, maybe this time we weren't faking it because it looks like we had a real bagpiper. Um, <laughs> so this is, this is a good photo of Cooley and I. And again, we were 100% just joking here. But, You know, he and I. So, uh, one thing too on Orkney is I got named, nicknamed Superman, and they, the people on the island made me a Superman cape that I still have today. So, with my name being Kent, uh, and I have the glasses, you know, they kind of thought I looked like Dean Kane, who I didn't know that's who played Superman, but that's kind of a good memory um, I have. Hopefully, Cooley. Uh, remembers the pipe band and will say something uh, on <laughs> Facebook or wherever. I'm sure. I'm sure he will. Um, you know, we talked about Gilmore uh, here. So I was with Thomas for six weeks in the office. So I think people questions were asked, but President Wilkinson is like the scariest human I ever known. Like he was the most intimidating person and president brains was the complete opposite. So, and same with sister Wilkinson and sister brains, sister Wilkinson was really nice, but you know, sister brains kind of ran the show more than I think president brains did. Uh, but they were, they were great and had a great relationship with them and helping being in the office when they, they came over was, uh, a lot of fun. Uh, and I talked to President Reigns a few times after the mission, but I, you know, from what I understand, his memory's kind of struggling. Yeah. Um, 
when he when he called me though to assign you to me he said you're getting my trainer oh really that's how he, that's how he introduced you to me yeah yeah he was well we will get to you uh mr pima arizona Every so I went to uh, the Wolf the Wolf Lodge in Arizona and Phoenix. Uh, it's that like indoor water park, right? And you know, obviously, I'm not cool enough to send you a text, but I was like, "This is where Jack's from. This is Arizona." But Pima, I know, is more rural, right? <laughs> yeah, way more rural. Yeah, uh, I, I, I do, I do have our time's going to be good, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> um. Krieger. So I haven't heard much from Krieger, but I had Krieger after Gilmore. Krieger was from Germany and he just wanted to race Audis as his, you know, after the mission. He just wanted to be like a test driver for Audis. Uh I really liked Krieger though. Did either of you know Niels? No, I don't I don't think we've actually heard that name before. Yeah, I, I don't think so either. It's a it's a it's a good one. Yeah, Niels Krieger. He so my fa- my dad went on a mission to Germany, and it's kind of where my family comes from. I think it was Persian immigrants into Germany. Uh, the Karish name, at least that's kind of also what my Iranian friends said there in in Scotland. Uh, but then you can't really trace it due to you know just records, right? So, but I was happy to get a German companion, and so I really liked spending time with him. But I was there for with him for for six weeks and then i went to go with elder bryce and i was the legitimate and i tried not to like be stuck to stereotypes but the laziest i had been on my mission was Mm -hmm. probably with you because i was the tiredest and i didn't want to say like i was trunky but i literally did live out of my suitcase like one of my suitcases like i didn't unpack it so I was the definition of trunky because I think that's kind of like what it is. Like you're ready to just put your suitcase in the trunk, right? Um, what do you, I mean, what do you think? What, we tried to work hard. I mean, it's hard to come in also to an area for your last six weeks, right? And I'm tired, uh, but I think we did a good job. What's your memory? I thought it was great because my, my first companion, frankly, was struggling a little bit and I mean, it's always difficult to train. You were my second companion coming in, and really, that's where I got like the translation of, "Hey, this is how it is in Scotland, and this is what it means in America." Like you, were, you were finally that translator for stuff. I was like, "Oh, you know." And then we had <laughs> some, some, some pretty fun investigators at the time too that we were able to visit, and good families in that area to get around. And then, yeah. Uh, you made sure we saw the area as well. I think because it was your last six weeks, you wanted to see more of Scotland. And so we, we drove around a little bit and saw. Yeah, we did. (laughs) Yeah, we did go to some, which is nice because I think looking back, that's like what everyone wanted to do a little bit more. Right. But we did like try to pay over some areas. I remember going, you know, to some more rural areas and I do have, you know, probably I should at least have as many pictures to to share that I have from what uh, I have shown Gilmore. But here is where the truth is told. He's got it. Snakes alive. So, yes, I do not like snakes. Yes. Elder Bryce tried to tell me that, yeah, in Arizona, they would just take shovels and take the heads off of, you know, copperhead rattlesnakes. And, you know, as if that would provide me any comfort whatsoever, uh, didn't. (laughs) It was a period where it was raining a lot, which is all the time. It was raining a lot. And what I think happened is this. So this would tell us that it's a North American rat snake. And my memory is, you know, kind of sad because I thought I was named in here, but I wasn't. but the story is in here. Uh, and we, so there was that family that had snakes and you've shared the whole story and it's the, it's a true story and came back one night and my suitcase was next to one of the, the, the like side heaters. Right. And so the snake was just finding a place to be warm. 
And so I went to open up my suitcase and lo and behold, there's a freaking snake in there and I don't know what to do. There's only like two snakes in Scotland and I think one of them was poisonous. I don't know, but I don't like snakes. And so we call that family and they're like thinking, what was, I, I do know that, what do you recall their last name? Copeland. Yeah, Copeland. So um, and I was friends with her on Facebook. I don't know if I still am or what, but you know, she's maybe not posting as much. Uh, or the algorithms are off, but we called them and they're like, you know, quit pulling our chain. Like, wouldn't you take us seriously? And so we just, I, they did tell us like call animal control or something. So we called them and they came and they got the snake and then, you know, they got donated to the Edinburgh Zoo and I think they saw in the paper, right? Because we weren't reading the yeah. paper, they saw in the paper, and so they're like, yeah, she Is saw this it and really apologized you? for not believing us. Yeah, <laughs> snakes alive. Yeah, I was freaked out. Um, so the story got to the newspaper via like the the animal control people. Is that how that happened, or how did it get to them? I what I think happened is the animal control they didn't know what to do with the snake, so they donated it to the Edinburgh Zoo. So that's that's what I think um, happened. I don't really know. And that's newsworthy in Dumfries, right? Oh yeah, it's <laughs> great. Yeah, but I th I also thought one thing that was pretty cool, Parrish, was yeah. that I think your last week you wanted to go see like the most remote part of our area where missionaries hadn't been, but it was part of our ward. So we went and visited yeah. some some members way down south and in Kakubre, and we ended up chapping into a lady who I went back and saw a couple weeks later. She kept her commitments and ended up being baptized jane wheatley so oh wow we, that's cool we met her you and i on a door yeah. approach um but then you went you went home and and the rest of the story is she ended up joining the church so that was pretty cool well you know we did the thing where we kind of looked at an area prayed about it and said let's go here and i think didn't we also cross into england by accident uh, yeah Yep, yeah, we're like, where's where's the border? Oh, there it goes. <laughs> or maybe it was on purpose. I don't know. <laughs> well, I remember also, Jack told also... me that story by showing me his picture of Welcome to Scotland. <laughs> yeah. But they also so Reno used to be like the divorce capital of the United States. And uh that's kind of like that other that border town right there too was like the divorce capital of the UK. Well, it's it's like the Vegas of Gretna, the UK. Gretna Green. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> the Vegas of the UK. As far as Mary, I thought, I thought my pictures were a little bit better organized here. The, well, now the, that now that you're going through things, I can see where I picked up some of my early habits of saving all the documentation and filing my pictures. I think you even pointed out, like, here's a picture album. Do this sort of thing. Oh yeah. Because I'm I'm organized pretty much the same way. I have the harvesters in my blue binder, too. So <laughs> yeah, I there's one really cool picture, and I think we were driving back up for a zone conference or something too, where it was really foggy, and we both had our Scottish hats, right? Yeah, I'm feeling. Oh, I don't know what it is. I've got. I open right oh, here. We go. Some of these. There's one picture. You can see that. Welcome to England. So we got that side. Yeah. Cool. That's right. Hey, look at you. Are you going to go see the new Bob Marley movie? <laughs> I don't remember that. Yeah, with well, definitely cool. legends. Um, I know I have more pictures than that, but... I've got one of me in your Superman cape. How about that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there you yeah. go. <laughs> I like that. Let's see. Yeah, so these are... So I guess what? It would have been since Gilmore you have, was... Do you have a picture of the snake? Because I've got that. No. I'll send you, that, I'll you, send that one to you. You send me the you're... article, I'll send you this picture of the snake. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. I'm almost these, you know, these things haven't been taken out for what two decades, so they're a little, a little hard here. 
I guess I got more than I thought, so I don't need to take them out. So I think this was like just on on one of the rural roads we were, but then we had uh, Kevin. So Kevin Nelson and uh, Gilmore, I think, were APs then, and had you there. Um, did you guys know uh, Kevin Nelson that well? I met Kevin after the mission uh, because we had a area in um, that we shared, not that we were there together, but some of the people that came to visit Utah um, is how I got to know him. So <clears throat> Kevin's a good guy. So there's a uh, hard to see, but there's my suitcase there sitting in the corner. <laughs> Some pictures with Jack there, and then I think uh, probably the maybe that's the best picture to show how friggin' tired I was. Like I'm over this. Send me home. <laughs> um, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if any of you remember this book. Yeah. Oh my gosh, yeah. Elder Holopinen called it the Blue Destroyer. Because, you know, I had all the references to, like, you know, prove why we're right and people are wrong. <laughs> uh, reference to the Bible. Um, I do have also, I don't know if it was carried on, but for the Christmas program for 20, 2002 and then 2003. Wow. <laughs> they were recorded. I've never looked, at, you know, to see if these things work, but... Oh, you know what's funny? This is how like outdated the mission home was. I have floppy disks from when I was in the office. <laughs> this one says letters, and this one says pictures. And I don't know what you would get on 1.44 megabytes, but you know, definitely have one of these things. Highly pixelated photographs, that's for sure. Wow. I'd be fascinated to know if you ever are able to open those up and see what's inside of the letters and the pictures, because I'm oh, sure yeah. there's some epic treasures in there. Yeah. Elder. So Elder Davis, I don't think he does much social media period and maybe he would listen to the podcast. Uh, but he, he borrowed my mini disc and never gave it back. And mini discs are like so hard to like, you know, find now or you have to pay a premium. So I do have like for a while, I mean, I stopped putting like memos or, you know, my tapes and had it on mini discs. So I have like uh, too many discs of like journals. I have to confess, I had like people, and people have talked about it, but re recording everything, you know, like, you know, the Truman, Matson, whatever series on profits, all that type of stuff. I, because I didn't have a mini disc, I, I tossed those a while ago. <laughs> But we do also, I think it was Sister Vreens that did the, the Edinburgh mission song because they wanted to have their own little, uh, you know, mark on the mission. But uh, got that. You remember the Edinburgh mission song? Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to remember what it was. I don't even remember what the words are. Different words set to praise to the man. Okay. Uh, That's my yeah. Thought. What about... Uh, Zach, did you have the Fredericks at all? I did, yeah. I was there the their first six months of their mission. And uh, what did you think of them? They had a different take on missionary work altogether, and I understand why. Um, with uh, President Frederick being a convert to the church and yeah. him, him not having served a, a mission as a young man, I mean, he was kind of at that point a pretty decent uh, deer in the headlights, really yeah. absorbing a lot of things, but um, they did fantastic work to the mission after I went home and everything did what it was supposed to do, I think, at that point in time. But uh, yeah. they were they were great people. I love them. Yeah, I uh, I grew up going to all the same schools as their kids, played rugby with okay. their oldest son, Nate, and their daughter, Jenny, was a year younger than me. And our ward growing up went in between of like sharing with a ward and then splitting and then sharing. And they were in a ward that was like always coming or, or splitting same thing with uh elder davis wow that's cool oh, what high school did you go to in utah skyline okay that's what i thought yeah 
There was also a Jimmy Smolka, uh, who he may have been a year and a half out from when I got there, and he uh, he was from Skyline. There was also uh, a sister McConkey. I don't know. Was yep. she on a podcast or no? She's been on. Yeah. So she's my she's my second cousin. So like, I don't okay. know. I, I had like it was kind of weird having so many people that you kind of knew, you know, that had been out there. Yeah. yeah. Was uh, Caleb Loveless in your group of friends at that point too? I want to say he was one of the kids in your neighborhood or school. No, but he. No, I didn't know him, but we went to the MC MTC together. Oh, okay. uh, I really liked Loveless. I liked listening to his podcast. Uh, he yeah. was he was intense and always like really philosophical. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So that was you know it was interesting about him. You know, I I wish like so this T book, and I know we're out of we're we are well out of time, but you know, I loved. Uh, you know, there was a Greg Slater. He was great. Uh, I loved Elder Cooper. Uh, Danny Cooper. Will Rogers was great. Uh, Will Rogers. He he for a while, uh, while while tapping, would collect glass bottles and bushes and then uh, sell them for the recycling. <laughs> so like, literally, he you know he would get some decent money off of it, but <laughs> that always just kind of <laughs> made me made me laugh. Um, you know, he was, <laughs> there's Rogers there. He's holding up that BB gun that he would just get shot with every time he walked up the stairs, which I just thought was grossly inappropriate. Uh, oh, there's a, I don't think he had been on uh, an elder hair, William Hare. Yeah. I've heard his name. Uh, he, so I was his district leader. Oh, there he is. He, it's in the uh, T book here. <laughs> I don't know why he's puzzled like that, but he did like board games. And he says, Elder Karish, also known as Chapping King. Um, <laughs> I actually ended up doing like online gaming with him randomly for like two years from someone randomly who had then became friends with him. So, hmm. um, hey, how, how about President Scully up in Orkney? Huh? Was he still going to church when you were up there? He was still still the branch president. And uh, Arnie and Mina Flett were still there, and uh, yeah. the bran branch was getting pretty small at that point. We had, and I have no idea if it was seasonal, but we had probably at least six to eight people on yeah. a Sunday, which was about about typical. Yeah, I did baptize a lady in the sea there. It was cold. Oh, really? Like That's cool. In October, yeah. Her name was Maureen. Sister, uh, probably say it wrong, but uh, Darlene Dula Derriere, Dilly Derriere, different name now because she's married, but she was great. Elder Menino was one of my favorites. Uh, was he? I think he was before both your times, right? Yeah, but we've had him on the podcast. Yeah. yeah, he was, you know, Sicilian. So, you know, you take him out and he's just going like this all day. <laughs> but he, he was, yeah, he was, he was a great. Uh, missionary, there's Krieger. Oh, yeah. Hey, here's uh, <laughs> thank you for the uh, writing in my key book there. <laughs> <laughs> so, I appreciate that. You know, I think this is the, the only time I've looked at it. Last time was May 16th, 2004, and you're the last one to write in it. You're welcome. But, you know, sadly, this is probably how everyone feels, but, you know, I probably go through that harvester and say all sorts of things about everyone. There was a missionary that was really helpful to me when I first came out. It was uh, Elder Brown. Uh, he was he was great. Um, I don't know why I can't think of his first name right now, but... Zach? Uh, mm, nope, not that Brown. Oh, not that Brown. Yeah. He, let me see if I can see you. Chad. Or Jeff. Jeff. It was Jeff. <laughs> and he texted me a while ago to say hi, but I really liked him. He had Elder Perry, who was English, uh, English guy that I liked a lot. Um, 
Elder Ames was great in, in Edinburgh. Yeah, you've definitely mentioned a few names of people we've been we have been in contact with trying to yeah. get on. So you can you can help give them a nudge. Yeah, for us I, too. I know Pierski, I became kind of social media friends with him more after the mission, but uh it was Chad. He's a good guy. Yeah, that was fun to talk to him. Uh Elder Amos, he was a great British uh guy from England. He's in Germany at the moment. There was Elder Granavich's. I commented on his thing because we called him uh Elder Green Apple Juice because people would have a hard time saying Granavich's. <laughs> I don't know. Well, you know, I'm not I don't have work tomorrow because my daycare is closed. I'm sure both of you maybe have to work. Zach's, um, Zach's self-employed, so he doesn't work much. Mostly on the podcast. If you ask his <laughs> wife, that's what he's working on. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jack. Run the bus right <laughs> over me. <laughs> hey, don't I work. appreciate it. Don't don't it's work. The best work. Oh man. And you're both in Colorado. Yep. Yeah. I'm I'm off tomorrow too. By the way. I oh yeah. All right. Well, so, you're still an hour ahead too. What what else is there to talk about? Man, you fit you fit all the things we normally ask people. You know, yeah. shouting out names and memories of the mission presidents and all that. So and and then we had a guest appearance from Gilmore. Can't yeah. beat that. So done great. I don't know how he gets around because he's in the smallest town there in Wyoming and he's flying all the time. Like I I don't know how how he does it. <laughs> and did he tell you he missed being the mayor by like one vote? Yep, he told us. Oh boy. Yeah. When we when we talked to him last, he had just lost the vote, so I think it was fresh. Yeah, he's probably not too happy about that. Oh man. Yeah. Out of the twelve people who voted, he didn't quite quite. <laughs> Gosh. Oh goodness. But well, this is this has been fantastic. And you know, we always mention to people, but I want to mention especially to you that I love you. I'm grateful for the the role you've played in my life and uh, the brotherhood that we have through Scotland. It doesn't get better than that. Really appreciate you accepting the invitation and coming on the podcast. Yeah, I appreciate it too. It's hard. It's like, you know, it's kind of funny. Like sometimes if you ever watch like medieval movies or something or where there's like a monk or something like no one, no one has replicated that except for like Mormon missionaries. We are the only like real missionary people. If you would like think of medieval times or whatever, like missionary work would ever be. And, you know, because it's so unique in the experiences you have, you know, basically when you're, you know, when you're assigned to an area, it's like you two against the world or like all the people there. And so, you know, you, you become, you know, some people are more challenging than others, but the ones that you really like, I mean, best friends forever, you know, you don't, yeah. you know, Zach and I have had some Facebook, you know, messages on things and maybe he feels the same that I feel, but, you know, instantly he knows more about my life having lived the same for two years than just about anybody. And it's an instant bond, right. Of having done the same things in Scotland. And there's yeah. no way other than like the military, it's hard to replicate that. Uh, so, yeah. you know, I feel like it's just, you know, those people are best friends forever. Mm -hmm. I think that's why this podcast has been so unique. Kenton is that I don't know you from Adam, but I, but I know Jack and because mm -hmm. we have that con connectedness of having lived in Orkney or having served in the, uh, the areas that we're familiar with together, it, we become instant friends because we probably had similar experiences at some juncture of our time in Scotland. And that place is just so magical in so many ways, both on the beautiful end and on the crazy end. And it's just so much fun to talk about it and hear each individual's experience while serving there because mm -hmm. every single one of us has different stories. We have different interactions with different people. Um, we had a missionary recently that talked about how many people from different countries that they talked to in Scotland. Like it's a melting pot 
really. And so you can have a different experience with any person you talk to, and it's just fascinating to hear. So thank you for coming and sharing your story with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Well, I'll I'll also express my love to you, Kenton. Thanks for being our brother in Scotland. Certainly love you. <laughs> love you too, Zach. All right, all all of those that you are in contact with, still, you know, we'll let you know when this is published. You can share it with them and push them our way if they haven't been on the podcast yet. We'd love to hear from them too. So, but thank you for your time. Yeah, see you, boys. We'll be in touch. All right, all right. love you, Kenton. Love Cheers, you, brother. Yeah. Bye. Bye too. Bye. Bye.